Now, while you're standing, we're going to be in Acts 20, and we're going to cover the first 12 verses this morning, and then should the Lord give us next Sunday, we're actually going to cover the verses that I preached when I preached in view of a call here over five and a half years ago. Should the Lord give us next Sunday, one of my favorite passages. The first time I taught that passage ever was at the Uganda Baptist Seminary. And it has been a life passage for me and I I long for us. It's Paul's last meeting with the elders from the church at Ephesus. It's him handing the baton off to them and and encouraging them in the word. And, And it's an incredible text. And should the Lord give us next Sunday, that's where we're gonna be. But we gotta get through this text first. And this text is about people who sleep in church. And this may be the more applicable text out of the two for all of us. In Acts 20, beginning in verse 1, after the uproar in Ephesus had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he'd gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. Then he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, he was about to set sail for Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy, and of the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, that's the Passover, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Some of you are terrified right now. (laughs) There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But when Paul went down and bent over him, taking him in his arms, said, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that your story can actually be our story. We are grateful that your song can actually be our song. And Father, we pray because praising you all the day long is difficult at times. There may be some who've walked into this room and what they're dealing with in their families, in their lives, in their workplace, in their home, and maybe tempting them not to praise you at any point today. So Father, would you allow your grace to meet them where they are? Would you allow your spirit to minister to them? Would you allow the hope of the gospel of Christ to prevail upon all of us in this room? That we may be filled afresh, we may be strengthened and encouraged with the hope of the gospel. And that we would go forth from this place with the greatest story there is, singing the greatest song there is. As we come to this text today, Father, would you speak to us through your spirit and your word? What does this have to do with us? It seems like Paul's travel itinerary from 2,000 years ago. What does that have to do with Tequila, Georgia on a Sunday morning in 2024? I pray you'd use your word to show us. Use your spirit to show us. Meet with us now, and not just here, God. We beg for your word to go out strong in every sister church across Gwinnett County, across Georgia, across our nation. Use your spirit and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. I don't know if you've had a moment that was not a finer moment in a Bible study per se, something you look back on, you're like, man, I wouldn't want a lot of people to know about that. Uh, having grown up in the youth group, there were always moments where some youth would say this or do this, and ample moments. Uh, how would you feel if you fell asleep in a gathering of believers and somebody else wrote about it in their book and people for generations could read about your Bible study snooze? How would you feel about that? And you may think I'm talking about Eutychus, but I'm not. I'm talking about David Platt. Uh, 
I did not realize till this week, our friend, David, and I have a friend, Tony Morita. Tony's written a commentary on the book of Acts. We've given it to all our connect group leaders. And I didn't realize till this week that Tony actually recorded when David fell asleep in, a men, in, in, in our mentor's home. Once, and now everybody can read about this great spiritual giant who was a Rip Van Winkle one night in a Bible study at seminary. And I often remind David of that when we're together. But he had been working, and, and Jim and Deborah Shaddix, uh, who I've asked you guys to pray for, Dr. Shaddix is dealing with a very aggressive brain cancer and has had multiple surgeries and uh, in the process of just trusting the Lord with those things. But they would always, they, they had groups of guys that they would welcome into their homes and with their wives. And, and the guys, we, we would share a meal together and then the guys would watch one of them's sermon and give each other feedback. And then the ladies would go and they would have a great time. They would fellowship and it involved no sermons. And having been married to guys who give sermons, they have enough sermons in their lives. And sometimes I was jealous because especially if I was the one presenting a sermon and Shaddix and Platt and these guys were going to critique, I'd much rather go with the ladies that night and just let's talk about it, girls, you know? But on this particular night, before we always split, we would pray together. And David happened to be sitting on the floor with his back against an entertainment center. And for those of you who have no idea what those were, back in the day, those were fancy pieces of furniture that held our really big TVs and VHS and VCR places. And he, uh, you know, is there, and we kind of go around the room, we're praying, and it gets to Shaddix, and as Shaddix starts praying, David starts snoring. And, and Shaddix is not deterred by it, he just continues to pray, and David continues to snore. And it continues, they both begin to get voluminous. And I, listen, I'm gonna admit it, I opened my eyes and peeked, okay? And I looked and no one is near David. No one, no one is in an arm's length of David. I don't know where Heather was that night, but no one is near him. We are dependent on the spirit and the spirit alone to do something in David's life in this moment. And the spirit is letting him rest. And so Shaddix prays, I'm telling you, for a minimum of 10 more minutes. He has not stopped. And I got to tell you, at the end of that, I am not praying or sleeping. I am dying. I am laughing so hard. I am shaking. I don't know how the spirit translates that in prayer, but I was laughing so hard. And Shaddix finally comes to the point. He says, amen. And David wakes up in that moment. And it, we laughed and laughed about it. I'm so grateful uh, this man that God has used has had these moments of humanity. And all I could think of that night was I made a comment from, from this text. I said, David, I'm so glad you weren't sitting near a window, buddy. You weren't sitting near a window. When we come to our text today, it's one of the most, one of the most well-known portions of this text is about a young man who falls asleep while Paul is preaching and then falls to his death. I don't mean to giggle about that, but that's what occurs. Paul then is going to go down to the street and Eutychus, whose name means lucky or fortunate. That sounds pretty providential. Oh, lucky gets to come back to life. Oh, fortunate gets to be raised from the dead. And while that is amazing, that's actually not the main point of this text. What's even more amazing is what they do after this. They'd already endured a lengthy teaching from Paul. And then after Eutychus' death, when he's raised, they all go back in to participate in the Lord's Supper and then to receive more teaching from Paul. And one of the things that we should ask about every passage is why did God put this passage here? Every passage is on purpose. There was no extra passages put in just for filler because they were trying to reach a certain word count in that letter. Everything has a reason and a purpose. And so for what purpose? Could it be to teach long-winded pastors wherever they may be, whomever they may be? Could it be an encouragement? You are going to kill your people if you keep talking. Please stop. You don't have to tell me. I know some of you've prayed for the rapture somewhere around point two or three in some of my sermons. You've prayed that sweet prayer even now, come Lord Jesus. There's greater chance of that than him making it to point four today, right? I know it. If that is the lesson that is to be learned, I can see from this text, Paul didn't learn that lesson. 
He's like, hey, Eutychus is alive. Let's go. Let's pick back up where we left off. And so between act one of his teaching and act two of his teaching, there was just an intermission where a young man was raised from the dead. And he said, no, let's get back to the big stuff. Let's get back to the important things. Does he include it here to warn those listening to sermons that falling asleep in sermons could be deadly? If so, I would submit that some of you have not learned that lesson. I can tell for some of you, 10 to 11 on Sunday mornings is the most peaceful time of your week. It's always a blessing. I'm grateful for those of you who fall asleep during the singing because I don't feel as bad about that. I put that on Mitch's clicker because I'm like, they were already asleep before I got up, man. So why then does he include this? Maybe he just includes it say, hey, if you're going to sleep, just know where to sit in the Bible study. Don't sit in a dangerous spot. I think it's included here because it's an example of two things, of God's power and Paul's pattern. Certainly God's power. This young man is raised from the dead and only the power of God can do that. But the bigger deal is the pattern of Paul giving these people, giving these churches his word. And we get a snapshot at Troas, and should the Lord give us next week, we get a snapshot with the leaders from Ephesus of here's what Paul's giving them. He's giving them the word, and this is his pattern. And as we come to this, it's not so much about sleeping, but it is about stewarding. How are we stewarding God's word? Are we receiving it? Are we relaying it? Are we being strengthened by it? The word encouraged, encouraged, and comforted is used three times in this text. The word encouraged is actually used 27 times in the book of Acts, and that word means to be strengthened, strengthened. And are we being strengthened in the word? And are we strengthening others in the word? Here's what I love. In his first days of planting these churches, Paul gave the people his word. Now we get to see his last days with these churches. And guess what Paul is still giving them? He's still giving them the word. He's still giving them the gospel. He is in Macedonia. And though it may feel like it to some of you, it's a six-year gap from when we saw him share the gospel with Lydia and the jailer and as they, they cast the demon out of the, the girl that was, was full of demons. It's been a six-year gap in Acts since that first occurred. Some of you would say, it feels like it's been six years, Pastor. It does. I feel that. But here it was, and, and now he's given them the churches to begin, and now he's giving them the churches, he's given them the word at the end. And there's this multiplying message to a lost and dying world. God's people grasping and being grateful for the gospel, growing in the gospel, and going with the gospel is God's plan for a lost world. And you would say, again, well, what does this have to do? Here's how I think it relates to us 2,000 years later. How much do you hunger for God's word? Whom are you strengthening with the word? How are you fighting for unity around the word? How are you serving and sacrificing for the sake of the word to go forward? And is there any fruit of God's word being born in your life? Is there any fruit? This is what we're going to see as we walk through this text. In the passage in the sentence, if you have our app or are on the website, the passage in the sentence this morning is just as local congregations are established and encouraged in the word, God will advance his gospel in the world. So as churches are started with the word and they're strengthened in the word, this is God's plan for advancing his gospel in the world, starting, strengthening, starting, strengthening, starting, strengthening. So I've written five prayer requests this morning, and here's the first one. Lord, please give us hunger for your word. We're going to start with the, the main story part of this text. In verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So we're going to pick up on the fact that it's the first day of the week. They're meeting on a Sunday. They're meeting to, to be around the Word and to celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's what they're doing. We're going to come back to those in the final section of our study. But the, the, the picture that we will see is after working all day, so they would have worked all day, they're gathering together to meet. And Paul is ultimately on his way to Jerusalem and then to Rome, and then where he hopes to go is to Spain. He's seen the gospel 
events all in the Greek world. He wants to see the gospel events all in the Latin world. And so he's wanting to move that way. And he knows that he's, he's going through and he knows he's not coming back to them. If you actually look in verse 25 of Acts 20, he, he tells the elders of Ephesus next week, now behold, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. And so here he has a moment in Troas, in Macedonia, to share with, these, with this church one more time. And I just wonder, if you knew it would be your last time to talk with your loved ones, what would you share with them? What would you give them? What would you offer them? The problem is we don't know when the last time is going to be, which is why we should maximize every time. Maximize today. This could be your last Sunday to meet with your connect group. It's a great Sunday to encourage one another in the word. And this is what he's doing. He's using his word to equip them. If you look again in Acts 20 and in verses that he tells it, look in verse 21 or in verse 20, he says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both the Jews and the Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 26, he says, I testified to you today, I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And then verse 31, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not see Snyder Day or admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sacrificed. I share that because here we get a synopsis. This, this is what Paul's doing. He's giving them the word. He's encouraging them in the word. Now, it just so happens happens this room where they're gathered there are many lamps those aren't light switches for those of you those are those are torches those are candle type things that would have been in the room and would have been absorbing the oxygen and unlike this room it was warm I know some of you pray for it to be colder in here every week you're like it is not cold enough can we get it even colder I want to tell you the reason we keep it cold is we don't want any of you to fall asleep and fall out a window in this room. It is for your own safety. We keep it very cool in here. They did not have that and it was getting warm. And as it was getting warm and as Paul was teaching, you have Eutychus and his, hey, the words here, he's probably between an eight and 14 year old. See, he's like, I told y'all we should have had a youth group service separate and I wouldn't have ever died in that adult service, right? He's in there, he's involved, poor fella. He probably worked all day and Paul's teaching and it's getting warmer. He's actually sitting by the window because this is where the breeze would have been. You know, he's not like Tina. Why? He's not selfish at all sitting right where the wind's blowing, right? No, <laughs> he is. He's taking that place and I'm sure all the people love the breeze that was coming from around him if he'd worked all day. But there he is and it's getting warmer and he can't fight it anymore. And Luke, the doctor, simply says, overcome by sleep, he fell down from the sto third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went over, bent over him. And there's a picture of Elijah and Elisha from the Old Testament who laid over those who had died and saw them raised. And that's what Paul does here. He raises. What's amazing is to me, they didn't end the Bible study. They didn't end the Bible study. How many of you say, if you died in the service... And we're brought back to life, you would at least consider going to the brunch apothecary in the next five minutes. You would consider going, I don't know if I want to walk back in that place, right? They all go up. It says when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak. And then look at this. It says verse 12, they took the youth away alive. And we're not a little comfortable. Even Eutychus didn't get a pass. So some of you students who had prom last night and you're here this morning, Eutychus didn't get a pass and he died, all right? And so you're here, he's here. They were all there and they were gathering. No one left until daybreak. Derek Thomas has written and he says, there was a remarkable thirst for the word of God. This is evidence of the Spirit's work creating a longing for the word of God. They were eager to know more of Jesus Christ. They wished to be instructed in the faith. There will not be any great reformation in our churches or our personal lives if such a thirst is absent. If we're content to hear one sermon a week lasting 20 minutes, then we're displaying a condition of spiritual sickness. Unless we cultivate an appetite for the exposition of scripture, we'll never grow as Christians. Instead of being among those who are always wanting less exposition, we should be among those who always desire more. And as I studied this text, I was struck this week to say, man, do I hunger for the word like this? 
Now, Paul knows it's going to be his last time. They may not know that or not, but Paul is in town and Paul's teaching. And even after having worked all day, they made it a priority because they wanted to be there. They wanted to hear, do I prioritize receiving the word? You're here this morning and I'm grateful for that. There's another pastor in Tallahassee who always says Sunday morning church is a Saturday night decision. You, you decide what you're going to do because some folks will wake up and say, hey, I'm tired. And even what we do determines our alertness on the Sunday morning and our willingness. And so do we prioritize receiving the word? How long am I willing to linger and be equipped in the word? What do I let distract me from the word? How many of you look on your phones during our service? How many of you look on them during a connect group? How many of you look on them during a family devotional there. How many of you, when you're trying to have your own quiet time, allow yourself to be distracted by a device and the things of the world? And then one of my questions was, do I have a distaste from the word? Listen, if you would say you're a believer and you don't long for the word, something is wrong. The Spirit creates a hunger for His Word in our lives. And they've gathered here after working all day, and this pastor is equipping them in the Word, and they want it. I spoke about David Platt earlier. Secret Church is coming up in a few weeks. I don't know the exact date. Our C20 folks will know for sure. And it usually advertises here. When Secret Church first started, David wondered, would there be a hunger for the Word? And, and would there be those who would be willing to gather and really not have a lot of other elements, not a lot of singing that some of it has changed a little through the years where there's some singing and especially praying, but mainly he wondered, would there be anyone who just hungered for the word? And of course, Secret Church has been a, an event that's gathered and spread over 50,000 people across the globe often participate in this ministry that David does where he just teaches from the word all night long. There's a hunger for the word. And as I came to this text, I wondered, you know, we look at the clock, we're held by the clock and, and we think, hey, this is as long as I can go or this is as long as I want. And I just was challenged in my own life. Am I longing for the word so much that it's like, Give me all of it that you can give me. Let me receive it and let me be diligent to steward it well. Uh, Tony, in that commentary, has written some suggestions for listening to the word. And I would just share some with you. He says, listen humbly. Realize you need God's word. Don't listen with a grudge or with a spirit of arrogance. Don't even allow familiarity with the text or weave and with the speaker's general message to block your desire to meet Christ in the scripture. I can't tell you how many times I've studied Noah's Ark and I've learned something that I didn't know before. There's something there. And sometimes we let familiarity be like, oh, there's nothing new to learn. Friends, there's always something new to learn in God's word. Listen intently. Do whatever you need to do to stay focused into the message. Listen biblically. Use your mind to weigh what's taught against what you know from the rest of the Bible. Listen personally. Listen for yourself, not just someone you know who probably needs to hear this. Listen communally for the good of your brothers and sisters. There may be something you hear that you are going to pick up to share a word that someone does need that you can encourage them. Listen missionally. Don't just be a receiver of the word. Be a steward of it. Listen practically, thinking about ways your life should change or your behavior based on what you hear. And then listen gratefully. This is God's word given to you. And so my prayer is, I looked at this, I said, Man, Lord, give us a hunger. Give us a hunger. We want to gather. We want to sing the word. We want to pray the word. And you know, I'm never in a hurry in this room because there's only one time that we all actually come to this campus and do this in a week. And I don't want to sacrifice the singing. I don't want to sacrifice the praying. And I certainly don't want to sacrifice our time in the Word. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't do it better or that I can't get better as a communicator or I can't be clear. Those are all things, believe it or not, I still strive for every week. What is the most helpful way to communicate this text to all of you? I picture your faces and where you sit. And thankfully, you're Baptist, so you don't change where you sit. So as I do my preparation, I know where my sections are, and I can see your faces. And some of you, I can see your eyes. And so here it is. And there's, there's this, it doesn't mean that we can't do it better. And it's not about just listening to preach. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you you should just listen to a long-winded preacher. No, no. What I'm saying in each of us, we should have a hunger for God's word because God's word meets something in our life 
that nothing else can be a substitute for that. And do you have that hunger this morning? That's all I'm asking. Are you willing, if there was an all-night study of the word, to sit through that? Are you willing, if we were going to meet together every day? One of the things we talked about, one of the times I talked in Uganda, the church there in that particular location, they actually gather every morning before they go to work. They start their time in the Word. And I got to tell you, it's not easy. They ride buses. They ride motorcycles to get there, as, as to, to find a way to get, to gather together, to start their day in the Word, and then go forth. Well, why do we do that? It's because when we receive the Word, God encourages us and strengthens us with His Word. That's the second prayer request. Lord, please encourage and strengthen us with your Word. We want to hunger for it because, as we said, there's no substitute for God's word in our lives. And so here's Paul, starting, strengthening, starting, strengthening. He's establishing the churches with the word. He's encouraging them in the word. And churches that keep going with the word are churches that keep growing in the word. So churches that are going to go forth this week with the word are those that are growing in it day by day by day by day. And the reason that he had to encourage them in the word is because these churches and where they're listed, persecution was going on. We've already seen that in Thessalonica. We saw that in all of Macedonia, actually where he is. There's real persecution. There's abandonment. When people became believers, some of their family members are abandoning them. There was loss of jobs. There was loss of possessions. There were real costs. And all of those things are tempting to say, hey, don't keep going on in this mess. Go back to your regular life. Go back to the way it was. Stop rocking the boat. And so Paul knows as he's established these churches, these churches need to be encouraged. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And what I love is that Macedonia and Greece and ultimately Syria that's there. And then you get over to Rome Places are different in the world because Paul was there, but not because of just his ministry friends, but because of the message that was that ministry. Hudson Taylor, though there are many difficulties with the nation of China, Hudson Taylor is a different place because people like, China is a different place because people like Hudson Taylor, Gladys Allward, Lottie Moon, took the message of the gospel to that place. India is a different place because William Carey helped bring the gospel to a difficult place. Myanmar is different because Adnaram Judson showed up with the gospel. The Congo is different because Helen Rosevere showed up with the gospel. Ecuador is different because Jim Elliott and his friends showed up with the gospel. And they did not have a long ministry, but the message remains. And the message is the ministry. And the impact is in part in all those places is how they steward the word of God. So in a hundred years, will Decula be any different because of how you stewarded the word of God here? Will there be anything different? Will there be an encouragement? You go back through in verse one and it says, after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. So he encourages the church there at Ephesus actually for his last time. He then goes and when he goes through the regions of Macedonia, we don't know how long that was, but he gave them much encouragement. And what is he doing as he does that? For instance, he's, he's saying, here again is the gospel. Here's how you live in the power of the gospel. Here's how you grow in the gospel. Keep striving to understand and live in light of the gospel. Keep sharing the gospel. We know that because that's what he tells you in Acts 20. He says, this is what I did for three years in Ephesus. I was helping you understand and grow in the gospel. That's what we're called to do. Help each other make sure we understand clearly what the gospel is and then the hope of the gospel for our marriages, for our relationships, for our lives, and that we keep clarifying and then we work against threats, we work against sin that would tempt us to grow in those things. This is what we do. We encourage each other. Hold your place in Acts and turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Turn to Hebrews 3 for a moment. I always say we'll know how healthy of a church we are based on how true Hebrews 3 is of us.
Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, and indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Friends, you'll know how connected your connect group is based on how many days of the week you encourage each other in the gospel. You'll know how healthy we are as a church based on how serious we take this. How many of you have ever found that sin takes a day off? How many of you have ever found a day where you weren't tempted to sin at all? Sin never takes a day off. The flesh never takes a day off. The devil never takes a day off. The world never takes a day off. The church should not take days off from encouraging each other in the gospel. Not only, this isn't about just receiving. That, that's what makes you a project. You've already received the gospel. This is about growing in the gospel, being reminded, having your heart recalibrated to the beauty and wonder and the hope. You aren't called to live and be good people in Decula. You are called to be gospel people. The hope isn't that you make a resolve in this room to do better or be better. The hope is that you find the resources in Christ and in his power, you go forward. And that's what we're called to remind each other and to encourage each other and to strengthen each other because our hearts are fickle. Every day they wake up and the very first thing, friends, they're tempted to be selfish. They're tempted to only want to serve themselves. And so this is what Paul is doing. He's going back through all those churches and he's encouraging them. We never get over the gospel. We go deeper into the gospel. The gospel becomes deeper and wider and broader and ministers and we understand more the hope of it. We understand when Paul says, therefore, he gives us the hope of how we're supposed to do whatever's coming next. When he says, by God's mercies, how many of you need to be reminded of God's mercies each day? How many of you are thankful that his mercies are new every morning? How many of you feel like you used them up in the first five minutes? Yeah? You're never going to use them up. They're going to be there. And we have to remind each other, keep looking to Christ. Don't choose sin today. Choose Christ. I know that some of you have group text. I know that some of you have ways that you communicate with each other. Man, communicate. Live for Jesus today. Look to Jesus today. Hope in Christ today. Find the strength that you need. And so he's strengthening with the word. He also strengthens them through the writing. During this time period when he's here and he's visiting these churches, this is when he says he's going to go to Greece in verse 3. There he spent three months when a plot was made against him by the Jews, was about to set sail for Syria. He decided to return through Macedonia. He spent three months in Corinth, and that's where we know for sure that in this time he wrote 2 Corinthians and he wrote the book of Romans. We quote from 2 Corinthians at the end of every every service here. His ministry with the word still impacts every Sunday at Hebron Baptist Church. And then the book of Romans. Any of you ever been encouraged from the book of Romans? And this is where it was. And, and so that sharing of the word and that writing of the word to strengthen us. And Romans 1 through 11 is, here's the gospel. You can be justified not by your works, but by his works. You can be justified by faith. And that while you were a sinner, Christ died died for you. Therefore, now walk in the power of this. And every day you present your life as a living sacrifice to God to say, you have redeemed it. It's yours. That's what he does. And that's what it means to encourage and strengthen each other in the word. But he wasn't just strengthening them so that we could have a holy huddle. It wasn't just so we feel good about ourselves. It's great. We are called to minister to each other. But we have also been called to strengthen, be strengthened, so we would go out on mission. And so Paul is strengthening them because the plan for Philippi was the church in Philippi. The plan for Thessalonica was the church in Thessalonica. The plan for Ephesus was the church in Ephesus. So as the believers are growing in the word, the believers will go forth with the word. And the gospel will advance through Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth. Athens, Ephesus, that is the plan and the plan hasn't changed and there is no other plan for Decula. God strengthens his church with his word and as they are encouraged in the gospel, as they understand it better, and the best way you do that is you study book after book in the Bible 
And God teaches you about himself and he teaches you about the hope because this book has one overarching message and it's what God has done to have a people for his name's sake who are called and formed and created and reconciled for his glory. And this is what we encourage each other with. So I look at this text and I'm like, Lord, please give me a hunger for your word. Don't let me ever be bored with your word. If I am bored, let let me tell you what my college pastor taught me. He says, through the discipline comes the delight. How many of you maybe have ever said, I don't feel like doing Bible study today? Anybody, if we're honest? How many of you ever said, I don't feel like praying or singing? How many of you found if you wait till you feel like it, you may never do it, right? I don't feel like walking on a treadmill. I'm still waiting for the feeling. I am waiting to get there. Then I'm going to wake up and be like, it's treadmill day. But if we wait on the feeling, friends, feelings betray us. I learned that from Star Wars. Feelings betray us. Through the discipline comes the desire. Through the discipline to say, I don't feel like going to Hebron today. But by coming anyway, guess what God may do? He may surprise you and minister to you. I don't feel like being in the word, but guess what? When you open that word, guess what the spirit may do? He may minister to you. And so my prayer is, Lord, give us a hunger for your word. And then Lord, let us strengthen and encourage one another with the word. As much as I would love to, I would love to encourage every one of you with the word. And maybe we need to be better. Maybe there's a a daily thing that's sent out. I know that 50% of you read the emails anyway, but maybe there's some other method that I could do that. But primarily, it is your responsibility to encourage one another with the word. In the relationships that God has given you, moms and dads, encouraging your children in your home with the word. Singles and college roommates that are rooming together, encouraging one another with the word. And that's what he's doing. He's not doing any other crazy thing. He's giving them the word. He's like, here is the gospel. Grow in the gospel. Go with it. The third prayer request that we get to then is not only just give us a hunger and encourage and strength, Lord, unite us in your word. Look at the different uh, cities that are represented by Paul's band of brothers that are traveling along with him. You have Berea represented. You have Thessalonica represented. You have Derby represented. You have aspects of Asia Minor that are represented. And, and different regions. So they're not all from the same region. Those, aren't, all those would be from different countries. So Macedonia, from uh, Asia Minor, even from um, Turkey, from Greece. So different areas that are represented, that are being pulled together here. And what I love, there's cultural diversity, but there's committed unity around the gospel. There's cultural diversity, but there's committed unity. And even in this list, we were able to tell that there were some that were from one level of society and some that were from a different level of society. And here they are, they're being brought together. This last week, I taught on prayer uh, in our student ministry. So we're in our equipping uh, classes era of student ministry. And on Wednesday nights, the students can decide which classes they are. Now, I want to tell you that Tate really did a number on me and Nathan. As the classes were announced, here's how that went. If you are a senior, you can take a class with Joel, our college minister. If you are a high schooler, you can take a class with Tate. If you are a female, you can take a class with Anna. Middle school boys are not listed in any of those other three categories. But middle school boys, you are welcome with me and Nathan. And teaching you about prayer has caused me to pray a lot. But we didn't have just middle schoolers, we had all. And you know what I love about our student ministry? We have people from multiple public schools. We have people from multiple private schools. We have people from multiple home schools. Nothing more than the homeschool co-ops raging against each other in the hallways. I love it, right? There is a diversity, but there is a unity, and it's because of the gospel. I love that next week, should the Lord give us next Sunday. I love when we did Taste of the Nations last year. Number one, the food was incredible. 
But number two, the fellowship was even sweeter. And it's a picture of what God is doing to bring people together. And I just want to say this right now. It's 2024. Did you know that? Should the Lord give us November, there's something coming. Did you know that? There is an election coming, in case you have been able to sleep peacefully and weren't aware of this. There's an election coming. Here's what I would say, friends. We should fight like warriors not to let anything divide us ever because we're so united in the gospel. We should have a commitment that we never let politics divide us. Should we back candidates we hope will represent Jesus? Yes. Should we vote? Yes. Should we worry? Never. Because you know who reigns over our country? God. That's who reigns. Should we be as diligent as we can with the processes? Yes. Should we ever let them divide us from brothers and sisters in Christ? Never. We should be united around the gospel. And I wonder, friends, here's this unity. Guys who would not have been together for any other reason, from different places. And who is that, friends? If you look at our youth group, who is it that, that's going to come in who may not connect with anyone else for any other academic or athletic or artistic reason, but because of the most important reason, Christ has redeemed us all. Who is it that's going to come in? And are we willing to fight to preserve that unity? And so you know, where are we in that? Are we being unnecessarily divided right now from people in your connect group? And you shouldn't let it be the case because we are united in the word, which gets us to the fourth request. Lord, help us to support and serve your word. What they're doing together is they're serving and they're ultimately going to take an offering to Jerusalem together and so they've been brought together. But as we talked about earlier, I'm, I'm challenged by Paul and I'm challenged by the years that he just gives to the gospel. Again, I told you it was six years since he first stepped foot in Macedonia. It's been six years since that. And he's given the Lord those six years of his life. They're spending three months in this area. And then this whole group of guys is traveling. They're giving time. There's this flexibility about it. We're going to talk about it. When I think about what Paul is doing, man, he lived in a day where there were no airplanes or cars or even paved highways. He had to go everywhere by foot or donkeys or sailing vessel, and none of which were speedy. He didn't have a telephone phone to call and talk with leaders of churches that he'd founded around the Roman Empire. He couldn't even call someone across town. If he wanted to see the person, he had to walk across town and hope to find them there. He didn't have computers, email, uh, copy machines, or other modern tools that make communication is easier. He spent many years in prison, uh, many years of his ministry in prison, unable to move about freely, but he and he contended with fierce opposition both from outside and inside the church, and yet after 25 to 30 years, Here's this lasting impact because his life was given to serving the sake of the gospel. And if it means I'm in Corinth for three months, I'm in Corinth for three months. If it means I have to be in prison in Philippi for a night, I'm in prison for Philippi for a night. And then these other brothers, they left their families. They left other jobs that I'm sure they had because they were part of getting this offering ultimately to uh, Jerusalem to support the church there and the work that was there. And I just come back to what does our availability and flexibility look like for the kingdom of God? Do we just say, hey, here's my plan for the next six months? Here's what I'm going to, well, Lord, I know someone needs to do that. Can't be me. I've got this job I got to do. I got this responsibility. And I'm just challenged. And what am I willing to do? What links am I willing to do to serve so that the word can go forth? And then again, as they bring this offering, they're giving sacrificially. They are serving and they are supporting. Everyone who is a member of this church, you should give cheerfully and sacrificially to see the gospel advance. When we put together our budget every year, we don't put together a budget to just accommodate staff. We actually discuss with you, we pray with you, because in the end, the real question is not, what should we do, what numbers should we put on a piece of paper in order to just be a group, friends? The question is, how do we steward the resources God will entrust to us this year in a way that will be for the greatest good in our neighbors and nations and for his glory? And friends, we have to give cheerfully and sacrificially in light of that. 
And then are we doing that? Are we supporting the word, giving our lives to be free however the Lord needs to use us, wherever, whenever, for however long? And are we giving cheerfully and sacrificially so that the word can go forth? You may not be able to go to student camp, but you can sponsor students going to camp this summer to grow in the word. What does supporting and serving the word look like in your life, friend? Which gets us to the last one. Lord, please bear fruit through your word. The band of brothers that we've mentioned, they are all from churches, almost all of them are from churches that Paul planted. What a cool fruit to be born out that he had gone and started and strengthened and now they're strengthening and supporting seeing the gospel multiply in those places and the work that's there. Another fruit is in verse seven. It says, on the first day of the week, when we gathered together to break bread. You see, it's the fruit of these places were changed by the gospel. They did not meet on the Sabbath because Christ rose on the first day of the week. So they live now in light of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is the first place in scripture where we see the church is good. We, he tells you on the first day of the week, we're doing what they would do. They're gathering and they're gathering to break bread and that there was a commitment to it. That's fruit of the word being born out, that they're lining their lives up with the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're breaking bread because Jesus said, hey, do this and proclaim, do this and remember. So they're breaking the bread to say, we haven't forgotten what Jesus has done for us and we're gonna proclaim Jesus is coming again and you need to be ready for when Jesus comes and we're gonna proclaim to you that Jesus is our life and that is fruit of the word bearing out is they practice what Jesus told them to do. He told them, hey, go into all the nations making disciples. He said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And here they are. They're gathering and they're celebrating the supper. They're observing what he's commanded and then they're going forth. They're ordering their lives. That's fruit of the word that's being born out as it happens. And then if you look at the last verse in our text, it says they took the youth away alive. Eutychus was pretty pumped about that. And then it says, the SV has an understated way to say it, were not a little comforted. But what he means is they were not just comforted by Eutychus. They were encouraged because they'd spent all night in the word. Eutychus had life and the church at Troas was full of life because the word was having its effect upon them. And then they would go one way and Paul would go another way. And the reality is they didn't need Paul. They had Jesus and they had his spirit and they had his word. And so Paul could go on about the calling in his life as he moves toward Jerusalem and then Rome and the church at Philippi, the church at Troas, the church at Derby, the church at Ephesus, they had what they needed because they had the spirit, they had the word, and they had each other. And the fruit was being born. What fruit, friend, from the word of God is evident in your life? What fruit is there? Can people see it by the way you serve the word, you support the word, you order your life? By the way you obey students, can... can can your friends see fruit in your life by the way you honor and obey your parents because that's what you were called to and you do it in the power of the gospel? Not because you're a really strong teenager. Friends, there aren't any. We're all weak. Our only hope is Christ. Is there fruit of the word? And I would say to you, if there is no fruit, it is because number one, you've never been connected to the vine or you're not abiding and obeying Christ. Because when you are connected to the vine, he said, there will be much fruit. So as I look at this text, my prayer is, God, create a hunger for us, for your word. And that starts, students, third graders that are in the room, if you're in Christ, is there a hunger for the word and how's that playing out in your life? Is there an encouragement from the word? Some of you are about to go to connect groups you're gonna have an opportunity to encourage and strengthen each other in the gospel. Are you doing that? Are you, you taking advantage of that? Are you gonna do it again on Monday? Are you gonna do it on Tuesday? Is there a serving and support? Is there a unity? 
around the word and you're fighting to be quickly reconciled to others, because look, we're gonna sin against each other. We are, we are sinners. There's sin every day in our house because there are people in our house, okay? But are we gonna be quick to preserve the unity in the gospel, seeking reconciliation, not waiting on someone else to come to us and seek it, but us seeking reconciliation, us offering freedom, us fighting to preserve unity so we don't let dumb things divide. Is there then this going forth and fruit that's there? Paul's ministry, as Binge and the crew come uh, to, to lead us in time of response, Paul's ministry was principally a ministry of the word of God. It wasn't so much about the miracle of Eutychus, that was incredible, but it was about the message that he'd been taking place to place to place to place, growing in that message. And he, in that message, uh, would encourage them to focus on what God had done and the salvation of souls by sending his son as a substitute and satisfaction for sin. It was a word that spoke of covenant promises that can't be undone, sealed in the blood of Christ. It was the essence of the word, words, good news. It was a gospel about what Jesus Christ had done and what he is still going to do. And the ministry was encouraging and strengthening. Keep looking to Christ. Keep growing in Christ. Keep walking in Christ. Keep sharing with Christ. I don't know when it will be, friends, but there will be a last Sunday for me with you. And if I know when that's gonna be, then I could certainly have some things that I would probably want to say to you. But since I don't know when that will be, and it could be today, it's why I try every Sunday to show you the gospel once again to show you the goodness of God and to strengthen and encourage you in the word of God. There will come a time where you're not gonna be able to share the word with that lost friend again because you're gone or they're gone. There will come a time when you're not gonna have a chance to strengthen that son or daughter or that brother or sister or that mom or dad or that aunt or uncle or that neighbor or that friend because you're gone or they're gone. Which is why we don't wanna waste time. When the Lord gives us a day, he gives it to us for a purpose. Let's steward that day well, and let's steward his word well, seeking to strengthen each other by saying, look to Christ today. Live for Christ today. Love Christ today. That's what's going on 2,000 years ago in Troas and it's still going on today all across the globe because the one message of hope has never changed and never needs to change we just need to steward that message of hope well so this morning if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ friends that's where the story and the song begin they begin with you not just singing about something you've heard, but singing about someone you know, that you know Christ. I beg every Sunday, and I'm gonna do it right now. If you're not a believer, you've never had a moment where you have intentionally yielded your life to Christ, sought forgiveness for your sins, and placed your full hope and trust in what Jesus has done, in his life, death, and resurrection, I beg you. That's what Paul told him in Corinth. I beg you, be reconciled to God today. Would you come in a moment? Ministers will be available. Chip Fitz is one of our elders. He's up in the balcony. If you are in the balcony, Chip, lift your hand. Chip will be glad to talk with you. You don't wanna walk all the way down. We've made it easy. We strategically place Chip to hide among you up there, to shepherd the balcony. Will you come to Christ today? For the rest of us, how are you stewarding it? If you don't have a hunger, maybe you pray this morning, God, I hunger for dumb things, worldly things. I hunger for social media. And that's not 
a blessing in my life at all times. But you created me a hunger for you, a hunger for the word, a prioritizing. Maybe you need to admit you haven't prioritized the word. Whom are you strengthening with the word? And I want to challenge you this way. If there's some people that are encouraging and strengthening you in the word, maybe today's the day you tell them thank you. Students, if you have a mom or dad, children, if you have a mom or dad who at any point in the week point you to the word, that is a grace to you. And you may have never said thank you to God for that. Today's a great day to thank God because he made no mistake in the home in which he placed you. And number two, to thank those parents for doing the best they can to point you to Jesus in a world of distractions. Who are you strengthening? Who's strengthening you? Is there unity being preserved and how are you serving and sacrificing? Is the fruit of the word evident? in any way and if not why not father we thank you for your word thank you for a chance to study it thank you for paul's faithfulness thank you that when we think about what method will start and strengthen churches we see it it's just giving that church your word giving those people the gospel then helping them understand it to grow in it to apply it to live in the hope of it And Father, that's what we're trying to do here. So I pray, Father, help us to hunger for your word. Help us to strengthen and encourage one another with your word. Help us to be united in your word. Help us to serve and support and sacrifice that your word would go forth on Fence Road, on 124, on 316, that your word would go forth from Hebron Church Road. We pray, Father, that you would help us to order our lives to see it go forward. And then, God, please bear fruit. And they were lining up. They were meeting that, that first day of the week. They were celebrating the Lord's Supper. They were lining up with your word, and that's our cry here. Help us to see what you say about your church and your word and tenaciously line up with that. To order our lives in light of your truth. So help us. Father, I pray for conviction this morning. If we can't identify any fruit from your word in our life, we should be troubled by that. Are we not increasing in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Are we not increasing in virtue and faith and knowledge, as Peter writes about, in hope and joy? Then why not? Something is off. So bring us to conviction, bring us to repentance, and bring us once again to the hope of the gospel. As ministers are here and available, Father, may we take advantage. May some come to Jesus for the first time today. It's in your name we pray. Amen.